afternoon, everybody. Uh, I see there's a, quite a group that uh, we have today. Up till now, 73 participants. I'm going to. I hope there's going to be even more. And uh, there's a good reason for that because we have a. Today we are going to have an amazing talk, and uh, we are going to enjoy to learn something about BIM uh, within a context uh, of uh, of structures. Uh, my name is Rade Haydin. I am a president of Infrastructure Management Consultants here in Zurich, in Switzerland. At the same time, a professor of uh, civil engineering in the University of Belgrade. And I would like now to pass the word to my co-moderator, Amir, please. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Amir Kedar. I'm from Kedmore Engineers in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, we design bridges and mainly deal with uh, also with uh, BMS systems and uh, bridge rehabilitation and retrofitting. So, Radi, back to you. Thank you, Amir. Now, our distinguished speaker today is Professor Markus Koenig. Uh, he studied civil engineering and applied computer science at the University of Hanover, and he also did his PhD at Hanover. He is now currently a chair of uh, civil engineering uh, in. Uh, in uh, uh, computing engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering at Ruhr University, Bochum, Germany. And uh, he is in charge of scientific evaluation of first BIM projects in Germany in 2015. Together with other experts, he developed a German roadmap for digital design and construction. Currently, he is a deputy head of the German Competence Center for Digitalization of Construction. BIM Germany. Uh, Professor Koenig published more than 250 publications, technical papers, and led several large research projects. For his scientific and practical achievements regarding building information modeling, he received the Konrad Zuse Medal of German Construction Industry in 2020. Today, he is going to talk about building information modeling, the state of art and future development, and he's going to put some focus on collaborative work method that creates and use digital model of an asset on the basis of consistent generation and management of information and data relevant to asset lifecycle, as well as for the sharing or passing of such information and data between the participant for further processing by the way of transparent communication. During the presentation, fundamental principles of an efficient and practical application of BIM will be introduced. In particular, the focus will be on the use of open standard established BIM use cases, challenges in data management and current developments in the use of digital model for asset management. Marcus, I am very glad to pass the word to you and we are, we are very excited to hear your lecture. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Shada. And um, also from my side, uh, Welcome uh, to my talk. So it's a pleasure to me to share my experience a little bit and maybe we have a, a further discussion about the future of BIM. So of course, there's always a discussion, this discussion where we go, what is the direction and uh, how we can bring this also into practice. So I will share now my screen. So let me try this and then you should see my presentation. This is true. Screen sharing is, is working. Yes, it's working. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, yeah, today I want to give you first of all, more or less a brief introduction what is maybe BIM and what is the meaning of BIM? And then I try to address some, some challenges, some recent developments, especially regarding open standards, data exchange, and as Rade mentioned, so at the end, of course, the talk is not so long. I, I will highlight some aspects about asset management and what we are uh, on what we are working at, at the moment. So first of all, I will start with the motivation. So I think everybody knows uh, this situation. You are working in a pro project, you have your task to do, your planning task, maybe do a detailed design, prepare maybe the construction works. 
However, so we have different phases and the main motivation of BIM was that we um, established a digital workflow in a way that we uh, try to avoid information loss. So that means we want to reuse the data we collected in a, uh, maybe during the conceptual design or detail design and bring this more or less in the same quality um, to the maybe the construction phase and operation. So at the moment, I think everybody knows, of course, we are working with uh, computers, we work digitally, we use 2D, 3D, uh, CAT systems, so especially in bridge construction. So this is very, very common. It's nothing new. But I think what we are not really doing at the moment, or with BIM, we can do this, that we really use the information inside these models, inside these data, inside these files, and use it for different applications. So uh, our experience in Germany is, is that we have a very good conceptual detailed design, and but we print it out onto paper or we create PDF drawings, and then we hand over this to the construction site. But this is, of course, maybe you use a PDF as a digital document, but in general, it's it's only accessible in a manual way. And this is the main intention, I, I think, of, uh, of BIM, and therefore we created a definition which is not related to a certain model or 3D. So we defined in Germany, for example, that we, when we're talking about a building information modeling, that we talk about the collaborative work to support planners, support the process by using digital models. So we have already these digital models, but we are not using these digital models in a way we can use them. Um, to get a more efficient planning and construction uh, process. And of course, uh, very important is then maybe the handover also to the asset management phase. So in Germany, there is a big gap between design and construction. Then we have different systems, different data we use, which is not really connected. Of course, it's connected because we are maybe uh, managing this in a bridge. Of course, the, the physical asset is there, but the dis digital asset, so this digital representation of the asset is not there in a, in a way we can use it directly in a con consistent manner. And uh, therefore, um, so also the BIM, these three uh, characters or these three letters, involved during the, the time a little bit. First, we talked a lot of models. So first was building information model. Then we, we are talking about the modeling. This is stay, uh, say, uh, still the name of this method. However, it's, it's a little bit more than modeling. It's more a management tool or management concept. Maybe it's a method. Or maybe I like this uh, uh, shortcut, maybe that we have uh, better information management, so you can also use BIM for that. So the main idea is here, it's really nicely depicted um, on, on this image, hopefully you can see it. So it's really about collaboration to improve productivity and, of course, that we can use the data in a more transparent way. That, the, that means in terms of computer science, so we have data structures, we have data models, we have data standards that everybody can use this data without, of course, you need some knowledge, of course, we need the engineering knowledge, but of course, if you want to access data, like you want to transfer some money from one bank to another bank, another bank between countries, there must be a standard how to do this, and this standard we need also for building information modeling. So this is the main aim here, and therefore always the discussion is, oh, I, I, I'm doing 3D planning for maybe 20 years, so I studied in Hanover. So in my first semester, I, I took a class for um, steel construction, and we used uh, software, uh, in a, in a, uh, which is in base of a 3D CAT. It was not very efficient to do this, but it was there. So it's it's nothing new. But what is new? So if you look from the drawing, so this was the first iteration to get to 2D CAT. We just copied the method. So we're drawing lines, and then we created some object, but it's still 2D. Then we started to think in 3D. Of course, then we have objects we can access, and now 
BIM is a little bit about this, so some terms like this, 4D, 5D, there is more information. So the I in the middle here, this is the important thing, the information we want research we did about how we can enhance these models, how we can use the information of these models, how we can maybe connect also different data sources, but so, because we cannot add everything in, in this model. So if you're thinking about bill of quantities or you have a, some kind of a, a list for material, of course, you can, uh, everything is a little bit in the, it's in the BIM model maybe, but then of course, maybe it's connected to some, some other databases where you can look, look up which, which materials are available, for example. So we need these connections between these different data sources. And also when we're talking about a, a model, it's a little bit like, like this, sorry that this example is for a wall. Um, I, I, next time I update this for maybe a, a, a bridge element, but I think you can uh, imagine, so we have this 3D model. So this is a 3D part here. So of course we have the model and we have information about the geometry, but if you want to use this, so we have to create internally more or less a data model, a database. So, so the, the element itself is not only represented by the geometry, it's represented as an, or used by an ID, we call this a global uni, uh, uni, uh, identifier. Um, so, so there is some kind of a data set available representing this wall, and then we can connect, like you notice maybe from well from some data database concept, we connect can connect this information with additional uh, data, like information uh, about the schedule. So we are not putting the schedule information directly in the model. I, I know some some people are doing this, but in general, we connect this only to this element. And we can connect costs, maybe we can connect bill of quantities and maybe some additional information about maintenance, maybe uh, operations. So, so, so in general, we create a big database and of course we create also um, a, a three di dimensional uh, geometry here. So this is the idea and you can add this later. You don't have to do this at the beginning, therefore the the model is getting bigger and bigger or the whole system is getting bigger over the time. So over the time is a good, uh, good uh, point. Um, so as you can imagine, there are so many possibilities to use such a model. And of course, we have this normally this sequence or these phases where you say, okay, I start my conceptual planning, detailed planning, then we uh, start a little bit preparing everything for tendering, then we go into the construction side where we pre maybe prepare uh, logistics, supply chain management, and so on. We, we try to find out where are some issues on the construction side and so on, improve this, make a documentation, then make it a handover. So the whole life cycle can have some benefit of this BIM model. However, every phase in every maybe every task in each phase has different um, information requirements we call this so so maybe at the beginning we more use the uh, uh, geometry the geometric data maybe later on more the information we call this always alphanumeric data so information about the costs and and material and so it's more important it's getting more and more important so it, everybody has a different view on this model. So you cannot create one thing, it's, it's useful for everyone. Maybe it's, you can reuse parts, but of course um, we call this always some kind of phases and use cases. I coming to the term use cases in a, in a second. So therefore to consider this whole process, you need to set up something like um, a step to define the so-called information requirements because we want to create besides the physical asset, besides the bridge, the physical way, we want to create a digital bridge. So and therefore we need also a planning, like you have a plan for the physical bridge. So we have to plan the information, how, how we can collect this information, how we can store it. So this phase 
must be integrated and must be integrated at the beginning. And therefore we created in, in Germany and it's, it's very common all also in other countries, we use the circle. You maybe you you uh, know the, the, the this triangle from uh, UK, where we have uh, also maybe a circle around where the information is growing, and so a different um, a style to represent this uh, uh, reference process. But very important, hopefully you can see. So we very important is this part here. Uh, so I'm coming to this uh, in a second. As before we start with our preliminary, preliminary design or, or conceptual design, we have to think about how we can give the designer some guideline that he knows how to create this digital data, this digital model. And uh, we call this um, the so-called yeah, preparation phase. So it's a little bit before you start really as an engineer. And therefore, it's really good to have some guidelines. There are some international standards at the moment. So one important standard is, of course, the ISO 19650. Maybe you're a little bit familiar with it. I'm going not into details here. And, uh, and maybe also you have some national standards. So this is all also is very essential because then everybody knows to how knows how to start this process and um, here we we created also in germany uh, some some guidelines how you can start and maybe i think it's very similar as in other countries so first of all we have to define these information requirements i'm coming to this point also later how to do this and how to map this to a digital model so here the owner or the, the representative who wants to uh, start the, the the building so the the client uh, must define uh, also what information do i need as a client to control to um, um, the project and maybe how, uh, which information I need uh, in the end for the asset management. So we, we just write down, please provide me this information, that information. So of course, everything is in the drawings or a lot, a lot of information is in the drawing. Now we have to transfer this from the drawing. You know, it's from the 2D drawing. Maybe there are some special symbols on the drawing and then you know, ah, okay, maybe this is a, a special uh, element I have to uh, maybe construct or I have to consider during the planning or the, during the construction, but we have to represent this in the digital way so then we give this information also to the engineers so we call this the sometimes we call this these employers information requirements at the moment only information requirements and then the engineer can check if he has the competence to provide this information and he knows how to set up the digital model so we have this more or less piece of paper where we write something now what we want so as we so we have a paper where we want a bridge in this dimension with maybe this num uh, 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 number of lanes or whatever. So we also have this. Of course, we have to write in the same way what we need as information. So in every country, I think uh, we uh, there are some standards developed. So we have also a national standard for that. So how to really define the information requirements. Then we in Germany, we said we, we need some kind of competence check. So you have to show me that you can do this so as an engineer. So of course you are able maybe to plan or de design a bridge, but do you have the competence also to give me the data? And therefore we have some, some kind of training uh, programs uh, in Germany and then normally you show maybe previous project or some maybe uh, certificates and then you can check okay he can really do this and after after the uh, tendering process when you go into contract and then you write everything down into the BIM execution plan where you really specify in detail how we want to work in a digital way um, uh, in our contract. So it's, it's, it's an, also an additional uh, document to the project management plan, but you normally maybe have, or we call this uh, maybe in different countries in a different way. But then uh, we need this BIM execution plan. And this is a, it's a 
living document. So you add always additional information. So it's not part of the contract or maybe only parts of this, but this is really where you say, okay, I have to solve a problem also in a digital way. So we modify a little bit, maybe the information requirements. So this is the way we start normally the BIM process in Germany. So we, we did this in several pilot projects and um, I come to some, some use cases uh, in, in a second. Um, so use case is a good uh, definition because uh, also if you talk about this, we have different tasks to do where, during the planning. And so maybe sometimes you need a model, sometimes you need uh, maybe all additional information. So, uh, so we started to structure all the tasks in the process by so-called use cases. I think also other countries and organizations uh, did this in the same way. And then you have to think about what I need to perform this task this use case. So how to store the, uh, the data. So we can then call about, uh, we are talking about a common data environment to store the data. Uh, we have to think about the level of uh, geometry and information, the information requirements, of course. Uh, what is the main aspect for the BIM execution plan? Uh, plan? What open standards we want to use and, and so on and so on. So we define this not in a holistic way. So we always think about now we do maybe safety management so what do you need for safety planning uh, what, what what information is necessary for you and then you maybe can access this information out of the BIM model. so this is a, a very intensive a preparation process which is now really in, in germany at least um, for the planning phase and maybe also beginning of the construction phase um, more or less complete so that, that everybody knows what to do. We, we um, published a lot of guidelines. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of guidelines are in, in German. But uh, so um, in, in, the, in the moment, we, we try really to bring this into practice by this, this, this guidelines. So also uh, another important aspect, how you can maybe come to this information requirements for every use case, you have to think about uh, three parts uh, in general. You have to think about what is essential for your organization who maybe owns the structure. So maybe it's more a portfolio management so that you have a good overview, especially if you're uh, talking about uh, bridges and roads and then tunnels and so on. So then of course, maybe the local authority or the, the, federal, the government have to think about how I can organize everything. Then you have to think about the specific uh, asset information requirements, what I need exactly to do the asset management for this specific bridge. And then, of course, you have some project information requirements, how to, uh, which informations are essential for me to really uh, support the project management. So in this specific pro project, maybe that you uh, uh, construct a new, new bridge. So these three parts um, and all for these three parts, we need, of course, uh, uh, some people who are doing this uh, definition, the definition of the information requirements, and then we coming to this exchange information requirements. So the, ex the information requirements we, we really requested and consider all these three types, and then we have the so-called project information models of an overview of what we want, and then we have to think about how we can contribute to the asset information model. And so I'm coming to, to this uh, at the end of my talk a, a, a little bit. So, so this is the main idea. I know it's a lot of uh, things to consider. Maybe everything is clear for you. Then, um, of course, you can maybe. Uh, follow me uh, very easily. Um, so very important is also that we not create one model. That's that's always uh, the problem when you are watching a, a video a commercial about them. There's always this big picture and everybody's working on the same model in, in real time. Uh, and so in Germany, this is not the way we do this. So we have separate models, maybe only for the environment, maybe for the geotechnics, for the structure, maybe for installations. So we have different disciplines and everybody is creating his own model. Sometimes it bases on 
uh, another model that you first need maybe the structure. Then, of course, you can maybe plan your installations. So there's, of course, a process that you get the model and, and maybe create a new model based on some information. So, and therefore, we have to coordinate the work uh, working with these so-called federated models. Um, sometimes, and this is um, also very um, interesting, of course, sometimes you have a, a strong connection. If you are thinking about finding a good alignment for a road or a bridge, then maybe you have, first of all, maybe the alignment planning. And then, of course, you want to create based on this alignment the bridge or the road. Therefore, we have to hand over, of course, information about the alignment. And then you can integrate this information into parametric software tools where you can easily create along the alignment, maybe the bridge or the road. Um, so therefore, really, you have to think about what is really the connection between these models, but because maybe if you start first with the alignment planning as a separate model and you just import this and then you create your bridge. And then of course uh, you can uh, give this, this model to the next, next person. So you have a lot of information exchanges and therefore it's really, really essential to use uh, open standards to do this. Uh, one thing we, is, uh, we always, had or a big discussion is always how we can maybe bring this on the construction side because a lot of people need still 2D drawings. Um, so I coming to this also uh, pay, uh, later as a use case, but a lot of tools support uh, uh, the generation of 2D drawings in a, in a simplified way. However, uh, maybe you have to, uh, yeah add some some parts manually so therefore of course we recommend of course um, to cr create drawings only to specific data drops to, uh, for a uh, at the end of some process where it's really necessary and not doing the, the modeling because the best would be directly um, communicate um, uh, using this um, uh, 3d models and therefore, the coordination is the biggest advantage of everything. So how does it take place, the coordination? So the, the example here is it's again uh, from a, a housing uh, um, uh, example, but it's, you can do this the same uh, for bridge construction. So uh, the idea is, of course, you bring together these federated models, maybe about the structure and the installations or some some pipes, uh, whatever. So di two dif di uh, disciplines, what you do today, maybe you lay over some two three drawings and find out are there some clashes, some collisions, um, and you can do this uh, now in 3D with different models and special uh, uh, special software. And this is really nice and you can also um, add some markings and you can communicate maybe some issues uh, to the planners. And therefore the coordination is the biggest uh, use case in at all. So, so the idea is this is a model, this is a model and this is a model. So uh, um, you bring it together into a coordination meeting is you are not copying the data in, into one file, you just load in three files, then you have, so this is still one file or one model and then you only have different views on the, on the on two or three models and you find out where are some collisions and the software will help you by detecting this and then you report back this um, to to the discipline. So if you find something in the federated model and you have to perform uh, a modification, then you say, please modify your file. And then you need to get again and have a coordination. This is the main idea about the coordination. And this is working, uh, uh, working quite well. Sometimes you use uh, uh, desktop applications for that. Uh, also uh, some uh, web-based applications are already available. Um, so, if you uh, think about other um, um, if, uh, use cases, uh, so, so there are so many use cases um, uh, which, which you can consider we in Germany uh, focusing on, I think at the moment, 23, 24 use cases for planning and construction. So that means, so we defined for every use case, maybe what is essential for the analysis of variance, maybe for, for bridge um, 
uh, uh, design and then we have uh, more or less a, a, a guideline what you can do, what is uh, necessary and uh, how you can maybe present and evaluate the different variants. You can do this also for tunnel alignment this is here. Um, so there is some kind of a, a master plan with a, a different examples available and we provide this for the planner. And of course, then you can communicate uh, different variants. And if you use a parametric modeling that you maybe modify only the alignment and then automatically the bridge will be modified in a, in a certain way, especially in the uh, conceptual uh, design phase, it, I think this is uh, very helpful. Then you can analyze maybe not only two or three variants, maybe 20 or 30. So we had a project in Germany, uh, a BIM project um, uh, for road construction. They analyzed, I think, uh, over 60 variants. Uh, um, so uh, normally it's impossible uh, to do this in a manual way. Um, so this is a very big advantage at the beginning. Then, of course, uh, Really important, it's not really in, 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 in use case where you have an additional benefit, but you have really to think about generation of drawings. So this was also very important for us because we have to bring this drawing to the cons uh, construction site. And therefore we also created um, a guideline how we come from the modeling to the generation to the post-processing and how we can complete some details maybe for bridge uh, uh, construction. So this is also written down and we analyze this also in relation to our official standards, how we have to create drawings and at the moment um, we modifying all, also our uh, uh, official standards a little bit because the standards only uh, uh, or based on 2D drawings and also maybe um, specifications, how you would do a 2D drawing and what to put where on the paper. It's changing now and therefore we have also to change our standards. It's very, so it's, I think it's, it's a very um, useful uh, use case to consider at the beginning. Um, of course, then maybe you, what is also easy to do a quantity takeoff. So maybe an example here from tunnel construction from a, um, a project from our railway. So they modeled everything in, in, as in, in BIM standard. And then of course you can calculate volumes, area, distances, everything you can uh, calculate based on the 3D model, extract this information, connect it, connecting with some costs. And for example, this is uh, quite easy and a lot of software tools are uh, available. And another point, of course, is uh, scheduling. Also here, we have a lot of opportunities maybe to connect the model with the uh, with the schedule so there are two different ways first define the schedule and just connect it however there are also some very nice software tools available on the market where you load in the uh, BIM model and then you define based on the BIM model your schedule and you can directly check if you have some problems in the schedule regarding maybe usage of uh, working spaces or um, that you will also integrate some, some resources and equipment that you find out where are bottlenecks or where, are, where, could, or where we have maybe problems. Um, so this is uh, 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 really nice and you can also um, connect this maybe also with um, some numerical simulation if you want uh, to, to uh, find out of if the, is, is this a good way uh, to um, yeah, construct maybe this bridge and you consider all regulations and that the, the structure will not fail during the construction. I think you are uh, quite familiar with that because you are more or less the expert in this field. Um, another point is, of course, uh, then we have uh, issue management on the construction side. This is also nice. You go there and maybe make a photo, document everything on the BIM model. You connect directly the data to the model. Then you can go into your office, check how many issues do we have in a certain area, uh, what, where are the location, maybe uh, you can con also find out um, maybe some interdependencies or you can uh, do a data analysis. And uh, in the end, you can also uh, perform some tracking. So you can say, okay, this is an issue you, do, you have to uh, do some rework and please give me a feedback if it's done then he also can do it uh, 
like checking on the on a, uh, 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 tablet and say, okay, I did this, and then you get, go to the to the uh, construction site again, make a picture and add it to the model. So you can improve the whole documentation uh, during the construction and of, of of course during the handover of the structure in the end. However, as I mentioned before, uh, so. For every use case, we are doing this for every use case, we think about what is the level of information need. This is a new term. So, so we analyze, we talk with people, we, we analyze for each use case, maybe for issue management, what is the process, how we want to work together, where are we exchanging data between the participants. And then in the end, we have to find out what exactly we need. So do we need maybe further information about the material? Then we say, okay, what kind of information we need? Do we need information about testing or whatever? So we write it down and then we think about, and then we are coming to the data exchange, how to put it into a digital model. Uh, so I'm, I have 10 minutes left. It's a little bit challenging and um, I try my best. Um, so, so this uh, level of information need is also uh, related, of course, uh, to um, the, the geometry. So normally we say, okay, maybe we have related to the existing uh, phases, uh, existing activities, which we perform. Normally we have a different uh, level of uh, geometry. So maybe in a conceptual design, we have maybe only maybe a, a very rough design, maybe only one or two objects, maybe alignment. Uh, the tunnel space, maybe then we define this in a little bit more accurate way. And as you can see, uh, so the direction is a little bit like this. In the end, maybe we have a complete detailed design. So also here we have to think about maybe a, a need for cost estimation or maybe quantity takeoff in a very early phase, only a very rough design. Is and how you can use maybe also a very deep de de design maybe uh, for the cost calculation at the end. So between, so there is an involvement of course of this model. However, I must say some, it's not so easy to extend this model. So you start with this model here and you then in the end you want to come to this model here. So sometimes um, you, you delete a lot of things, modify it, sometimes you start a new modeling. However, good is to think about what information you need to transfer from a rough design to a detailed design. And therefore, you, sometimes it's good to separate the data we want to use con connecting with this uh, or later. And so we separate a little bit uh, geometry and information. And this is exactly the idea of the uh, open uh, format IFC industry foundation class is very important that you really understand that we think about geometry and, and data and also in this standard we separate these two parts. So of course if you open an IFC file in a, in a, in a client then you see only the 3D but when you click on an element, you see the data, and but it's it's somehow in this file also separated that you can use the data also for other um, um, designs if you like. So uh, the, this standard, this IFC standard, is exactly there or developed for data exchange between participants. So it's not a model that I'm creating something and I'm using IFC for my model creation. I have a software. The software has its own data model internally, but for the exchange that you can export, like, like you have a, maybe a Word document, you can write this in Word, Microsoft Word or OpenOffice or whatever, and then you export it into an in format that both software systems can read. And important is here, maybe it's a little bit small, uh, that we uh, clearly have a good semantic so that we really define a, uh, consistent view that everybody is calling the element uh, with the same name and that is provided by the IFC. So there's a, some kind of standardization how we can exchange this data. However, um, also the IFC is not perfect. So IFC is only developed for certain 
use cases. That's maybe it's maybe it's a little bit new for you because everybody thinks uh, IFC can do. Um, so when we uh, extend the standard, we're thinking about what use cases we can support, and then we think about what geometry we need. Maybe an explicit geometry where we give directly points, or we have something like an alignment, and then we can say, okay, this geometry can support this use case. Maybe coordination, compliance checking, handover, and so on. And some are still not uh, supported, like a, a full design to design. So you use one design tool and then you hand over to the other, other design tool and you can use the data in the same way. So this is at the moment, unfortunately, not completely supported. Therefore, it's really hard to change the design software during the process. Um, and of course, the standard um, has only some international properties. So, so that means a lot of properties which we are using in, in Germany. So a lot of information we need, this is not existing in IFC. Therefore, the IFC has a an, an concept that you can add national properties or maybe also for a certain agency, maybe for the German railway or whatever. So this is very good. So we create something like this. Uh, so we create at the moment a national property server where we put collect all the properties and connect this then for the information exchange. So the information exchange, um, as I mentioned, is really um, uh, well, the IFC model is, or the IFC data structure is only can be only used for some uh, um, um, uh, use cases. So we have a report about the IFC bridge development. Uh, there are some implementations already available for bridges so that you really can use IFC for bridge construction. However, you have to check it. There's a report online which use cases are supported. There's, there are not so many supported at the moment. And therefore, if you want to use IFC for another use case, maybe then it's not working. So before I'm coming to the oh, last three minutes, sorry. Um, maybe I can go over this uh, very quickly. Um, so of course you need a lot of competence. So you need competences more on the strategic level, management level or the practical level. And therefore, of course, in every country we have now some, some roles like a BIM manager, BIM coordinator, BIM modeler. And of course you need to, to train your existing staff that, that's very important. I'm, I'm not going to detail here. So more important for you, to go back, is maybe asset management. Um, so of course, at the moment, we more concentrate on this part and this part, also in Germany. This is really a question at the moment. There are only some solutions, some ideas how to use maybe BIM for asset management. So it's really under development. So, so a nice picture here. And so, so of course, what we what we need, we need to import the data into our asset management system. But as I mentioned before, important is at the beginning that the asset manager def defines the asset information requirements before the project will start. Or, or as, so therefore, you start at the beginning with asset information, uh, asset information requirements, and then you maybe establish your information requirements for the project. Then you create the project by using the BIM execution plan. And then, of course, because you already integrate this information, then you have, can hand over this maybe to an asset information uh, system. So however, we call this at the end, if you're talking about 3D models and so on, the hand over to the asset management, we call this the asset information model. And now we have to think about So uh, my, my video is, is starting again. Hopefully I'm back again, also on my video. So um, therefore we created in a project um, some idea what is necessary for the information uh, for the asset management so asset information requirements so if you want to hand over a bridge in a terms of bim then you have a bridge maybe connected with 
images, with uh, files, with Excel, with a lot of data. It's a lot of data is maybe inside the bridge. And then you have to think about how you can transfer this to an asset management system. So there's mapping so from the model to the asset management system. So we are not replacing the asset management systems here. So the idea is here really to use so-called information containers. It's a more technical way to do this. So we established a concept. It's also an open standard. So really like a container where you can put everything into it. And this container you hand over. So you have everything like the, the folder you hand over or maybe it's, it's the a, a big amount of folders you hand over maybe to, to the asset management on a paper. Uh, we do this here also in the container. We put everything together, but important is we, we connect these parts. So we connect different elements to the model. So we're connecting this, uh, or maybe the connection is this, so, and everything is stored with a container. We also had a prototype like this, and how to, to do this, we are just working on that. And if you get one further information, maybe also Rade is, uh, uh, can, can share some information, I think, to the, uh, to the uh, Eurostack uh, members. And uh, of course, we have also a website. Uh, short marketing for, for our project. However, now I'm at the end, a little bit uh, nearly on time. Sorry uh, to be very, very fast in my explanation. If you have any question, I'm really happy to, to answer this. Of course, summary and outlook. Summary is, of course, um, as you can see, maybe a lot of uh, maybe things are well developed. So there is no reason not to apply building for planning and construction. At the moment, we have a lot of gaps uh, for bringing this into the asset management system. So we have our experience are really that we can handle the risk in the decisions better. So it's an information platform. It's not the doing 3D. It's about managing the project. And that's the same idea for the asset management. We want to manage the asset and how we can use this data. So in the end, of course, the vision is a little bit that we create um, a digital twin, so there are discussions, is BIM a digital twin or is BIM only related to this part? So in the end, the digital twin is a little bit more, you connect this maybe with sensors, uh, do real-time analysis and so on and so on. Um, but this is the vision and exactly this vision we have also in Germany. So the next master plan uh, for infrastructures will be how we can establish a digital twin for our infrastructure. I think other countries are doing the same. So I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer some questions. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. I hope everybody enjoyed what you uh, just showed us. Uh, I would like to ask uh, actually a question from a designer uh, perspective, okay? Yeah. Because uh, I'm designing bridges. Well, how how do you see the challenges that this technology actually um, is uh, giving to design offices by the man of uh, manpower, changes of processes? Because uh, in our office, we design in the BIM uh, some of the project, not all of them. And the process of design is completely changed from using BIM or what was before. Now, this is a big challenge for the design industry because you have actually to change all the duties of people. The, some people has uh, actually like draftsmen or other people that uh, actually this profession will uh, come to its end by the way of drafting, okay? Today you need an engineer like maybe like it was in the mechanical engineering before when somebody was using a workstation and designing and uh, and doing the, the drafting together. And uh, um, I would like to ask, what is your uh, actually perspective about it? Um, so I can only totally agree. Um, so this is always a problem with digital transformation. So we call this also a transformation. So like you mentioned for the automotive industry. So of course, uh, they, are, they replace a lot of uh, low, skilled worker, uh, only maybe worker with a high qualification are now doing the jobs together. And actually it's, it's the same transformation in, in the construction industry. 
So um, I think for, as a design company or an, an, an engineer now, of course, you have to think about, of course, I want to do, I want to follow, of course, then maybe the, at the moment it's, it's okay because you get a lot of projects where this is not requested. But uh, in Germany now, we, we mentioned this now for, for several years in, in Germany, 2015, we announced this digital uh, roadmap and said, we said, please, construction industry or designers, engineers, architects, please be aware, maybe in five years, we demand these skills because we think for, our, for us as asset owners, this is a... You, it's more uh, worse to have a digital model to operate. Of course, at the moment, um, we, we slowed, everything is a little bit delayed. Now we're talking about the next five years. So I think, uh, so now we have a plan that really in 2025, 26 in Germany, we uh, public projects um, will use BIM, then you need this. Of course, this is one thing that is coming from outside that you have to react. Uh, I know some companies, they say, I can do BIM. Internally, they use 2D drawings. And at the end, they just make a 3D model and then they hand it over. But then you have the uh, benefit of the process. And of course, you have more, more work to do. You do the 2D planning and maybe then you did two times modification of the model. So you have to really to think about, do I want to change the process? But you need to um, train people uh, and I think this is um, the, so this view that we have to learn our whole life and train our whole life also as an practical engineer it's now really t t the time to think about because the digital trans uh, transformation is a little bit faster than normal transformation so uh, I, I have no I, I have no idea what to do but I, I think I, I can tell you, I can tell you from our experience in Israel, some of the authorities, uh, it is mandatory now to use yeah. big design processes. However, the authorities themselves do not understand what is BIM. They think it's a 3D tool. That's all. Yeah. And when you're coming to, to, to ask them, do you have any uh, regulation, any, any papers, they actually uh, try to, to, to fit something to, to that uh, header of the BIM. And, exactly. Uh, as as exactly. Design, a design company, we get some problems uh, that we think that you first have to, uh, I will say, train the, 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 the authorities to understand what is the beam. Yeah, you are right. So as, I think this was also the, the problem in Germany because now we are so, uh, a little bit delayed. So we now have this. Uh, uh, we call this BIM Germany or Comp uh, National Center for Digitalization. Um, and what we created now is a training program for the authorities. So we are now training hundreds of people, uh, uh, hundreds of persons, so that, that, that they can understand what they really can request, what how they can use and therefore we reduced also our use cases so at the moment we are just requesting the use cases really simple use cases because authority can handle only these eight so our models are at the moment uh, not that complex with which you may sometimes see in in, in, in in big projects or maybe in research uh, but this is the way we have to train the local or the, the, the government people who are using this, who are managing this pro this project. So we have also a training for project managers using BIM, not only for engineers, sure. only for project managers. So that's that's the way. But it's take a long time. Rade? Yes, um, there actually are two related questions. One comes. Uh, from our audience, from Hanad Adelhadi, and he would like to know how do we develop uh, or how can we develop 6D B model? And uh, pretty much along the same line was the question for coming from uh, Vanya Summers, uh, which you would like to ask, are you thinking about several models such as S design, as build, as perform B model, considering data along the time axis? So maybe you can address these two yeah. questions at the same time. Yeah, I, I try my best. So I am. So it was sixty, right? It was sixty. Was the sixty? Yes. So I am. I am. I am not a fan. 
or support <laughs> uh, for um, um, using these terms because nobody understands what. Uh, so uh, especially 4D is. You can can argue what is really a 40 model, what's a 5D model, what's a 60 model. So in, in general, of course, this is marketing. So um, so if you're talking about, so you have to think about what you hand over now, of course. And this is the first way you have to start. So what we want to do at the moment, maybe nothing more. First step, I want to replace the paper and want to hand over data which we can access and use. So I'm not talking about a PDF, I'm not about an Excel sheet nobody understands. I'm talking about that we have data which we can, which is already necessary to operate assets. And, therefore, and this is maybe not, uh, so first of all, we have to consider this and how to bring this into in, in, in model. Then you can call it maybe as build, as design, whatever. So, and, and so for me, these are more or less words. And, and so, but it, it's really, and it's spe specific for every country. That is a problem. So therefore you cannot find a general term because we need in Germany different information data for managing our budget and maybe you know this rather in, in, in Switzerland or in Austria or maybe in the <laughs> Netherlands. Therefore, everybody has an own perspective and we have to define what we need. This is the first thing. We write down what you need and then talk with a computer scientist or computer, uh, maybe not with me, maybe with, <laughs> with a, uh, so talk with them and say, can I bring this information to the model and how I can do this? And I, I, I promise you, so the, at the moment, it's starting is not so difficult and they may maybe start with with some of this data and then of course you have to think about to connect then you can also integrate into the ex existing system because the demand the requirements coming from your system and bring it in the other way around make a 3d scan nobody helps uh, you, why you do a 3d a, a scanning or you have a point cloud in the end, what do you do with this? So more important is the information to collect. Uh, so this is my perspective a little bit, but I know this is not, not easy, but you have to focus what is at the moment need. And then uh, also rather notice, of course, um, then you can think about what additional data maybe is needed for asset management, only coming from asset management. What is it, what you, what you maybe, what is needed? Is, is there inform more information about the material needed to make a better asset management? Then you can think about But first of all, you have to consider or to identify what is really needed. This is my personal perspective here. Amir? Yeah, okay. There is a question from Jean Wonderly about uh, actually the, the large amount of information that uh, is stored in, the, in BIM. In theoretical BIM project, you can store actually very much a lot of uh, information. Now, uh, this is a challenge, okay? And what is the quality of information? And how can you uh, actually check the information and be sure that this is uh, actually uh, done properly or there is a proper uh, information? This is done by uh, people, okay? But then uh, uh, can, you, can you actually, uh, or can this be done by uh, some algorithm? What methods or algorithm are used here? Yeah, okay. I, I, can you judge them? Yeah, uh, so uh, a very good question. So for me, it's so there are two ways. Collect as much as you can, or collect as much as you really need, or what you really need. Uh, so only the data you really need. So this is maybe the better term. So, I'm not a, also not a supporter fan to put everything. So our models at the moment, really, are all models I, uh, well, where I do some, give some support or advice, say, don't put everything into the model. It's not necessary. So you put only the things into the model you really request. And if the authority cannot uh, use this model the, uh, or this data at the moment, maybe there are some, some visions how to use this, maybe then it's not necessary to request them. So we filter our model. So uh, the designers put a lot of things into it. And before we hand over this to the authority, we filter out a lot of information that is not too much for the authorities. So this is one point. So really think about what is really needed and what is really reliable. 
reliable information. So of course you could put a lot of information in a, a conceptual phase, but it's not really very very valid. So what you can check is of course is so we can we call the quality of the model. There are tools available. So on our platform, which we are developing for our country at the moment, you define the information requirements in a digital way. You get some kind of rules to check it. Auto, you can do an automatic quality check based on what is demand. So what we can check is something, uh, is the name correct? Is uh, the, the range of values correct? Is, is it there? So it's existing. Uh, are some connections there. So of course, what you not can check is really, um, uh, is this a good design or a bad design or um, something like this. So of course, uh, we, we need some, some, some these engineers for that. But you can check the quality um, and we define some, some kind of yeah, quality rules uh, in Germany, which really can, you can do this in the Automatic way, but it's not very common. And um, um, maybe if you're interested, uh, I can send you some some links about that. Okay, Brody. Um, there is a actually interesting question regarding the monitoring and, and inspection, especially usage of sensors and so on. I'm not quite sure what was what is the essence or gist of this or gist of this question, but the, I think that it it is uh, regarding the digital twin as you define in a in a broader sense so how this interaction between the sensors and the model should be in the future i think this is very far down the road at the moment but maybe you have some some kind of comment on that one of course, yeah yeah of course and um, so in in general so we have sensor technology so we are collecting data sometimes maybe the, the problem is really the, the, the management of this data the allocation where is the correct position of a certain uh, uh, sensor maybe of course here you can support this by a BIM model that you also add in the BIM model you're not modeling a complete sensor you just place something there like a sphere or a cube and say there's a sensor and of course then you need in some kind of um, interface. So there are already some interfaces there that you say, okay, if the sensor has some also some connection to the internet, you can just connect this directly, or you, you collect first the data, bring it to another server. So what we are doing at the moment it, in, in Germany, so we think about take over some ideas from industry 4.0. So also in a, in a fabric, in a uh, maybe automotive, you produce a car. There are a lot of sensors and they collect this. Of course, it's a fabric and everything is a little bit more uh, uh, yeah, safer and secure and it's not outside. However, there are so-called uh, um, uh, industry 4.0 components with um, uh, communication protocols between sensors and digital twins and this standard is there we can use this directly for for also as a management of bridges I, I think there are some some um, pilot projects running at the moment in, in Germany how to do this of course you need the system um, to to collect this data and then you need some kind of good uh, data analysis, a good visualization that you can access this data and then you can also connect machine learning. And so there are some interesting ideas in research and really to have a broader view, also look in other industries. And uh, this is uh, that, uh, at the moment the way so we talk about is the sensor has a digital, is a digital twin of a sensor. We have a digital twin of a sensor. We have a digital twin maybe of a beam. And then these two sensors, digital twins are communicating. There's a communication protocol for digital twins. So this is uh, uh, where we're discussing at the moment, connecting the real world and the digital world. I, I have a question about um, using uh, B models for inspection data, for example. Uh, now there's a trend uh, to use, of course, a drone with 3D videographing or uh, videography or uh, LIDAR uh, data that is actually huge in amount and can um, create a point cloud that later be transferred into, um, I would say, a BIM uh, model somehow. And mm -hmm. uh, I found out that there is a big challenge with connecting these tools together into a, a BIM environment. 
uh, on the one way, yes, and the um, and actually, in some of these, uh, there probably are needed automatic tools to do that because it's very tedious. You know? yeah. what, are, what is your opinion about it? Yeah. So there are two. So you have to define the real use case. If you have already a BIM model, then uh, of course maybe if you then maybe do a lidar scan or using drones, then uh, of course you do. We, we did some research uh, for in this. You do the planning of the flight and the collection of the data based on the BIM model. And then you say, okay, at this position, I take some in images and maybe uh, I know the position of the uh, scanner and the BIM model. Then you do only a comparison and you store also only the, the results. Maybe at this area, we have a deviation of about maybe standard uh, of two centimeters or here's a problem. So we are normally not, if you have already a model from maybe from the design or construction or so an s build model, then we only store maybe uh, information. And of course you can put the point cloud somewhere. There are some tools available which are very efficient, but you have to use the correct tools to look in both. Mm -hmm. But in general, best is, of course, uh, to, to think about what is really needed for, for inspection. The other way is a little bit about, about uh, there is no BIM model. So, of course, we have a lot of bridges, uh, existing bridges, and maybe first thing is really to start creating a BIM model for that. And um, then, of course, you have to can use laser scanning, um, maybe uh, um, drones, uh, pictures, but you have to use your drawings, the documents. You have to consider all these documents or information available, maybe. And then it's really hard, it's more or less a manual way. There are some, uh, uh, some research results at the moment that you can maybe detect some main components and assign some materials or you analyze some, some documents and bring this together. But this is really research at the moment. So um, I would say that you cannot buy anything which is really complete. So it's a lot of manual as, um, assets. So we have a project in, in Germany uh, about support also asset management and inspections. And there we say, okay, um, we have a standard procedure in Germany to do a bridge inspection and maybe we have maybe we start with the visual inspection then we do uh, normally images and now we do these images um, connect this directly to the BIM, BIM model that you know exactly where is the crack where is a, maybe some some uh, a problem or some some damage and then you can evaluate and can use this so this is also here we have to find out what is the best way not start with the biggest problem uh, use a BIM, uh, uh, point clouds and create a BIM model. Okay, this is now the last question because we are quite out of time actually. And this is one hands on question, I would say, that it's coming from uh, our from Mr. Tariq, and he is working, working on the large scale. 500 million residential project in Pakistan. And he actually basically provide construction sequence using Synchro, Synchro 4D Pro. Uh, is it possible to show four day timeline actual versus planned in a tablet or iPad? I haven't come across any app to do that. So I didn't either, so maybe you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not, not really. So uh, the problem is always with the 4D. Um, uh, so you connect the schedule and the BIM model in a certain software. So maybe Synchro uh, from uh, uh, software. So uh, normally use maybe in UK. So in, in Germany, we use maybe Autodesk Nevisworks is, is a similar software, or we have a special software, maybe Decide uh, in, in Germany. So the problem is here. You have the model and you define your schedule and you bring it together and then you have a certain data format where you can store it and mm -hmm. only this format you can reuse. So you cannot transfer it maybe to a different app because the other uh, softwares cannot use it. So there is missing, of course, for example, an open standard for 4D. Uh, I've seen supporting something like this. And then maybe you can also create uh, applications for your tablet and so on. I think this is the biggest challenge at the moment that because everything is more or less closed and cannot reuse. Okay, then I give back to Amir for the last words. Yes. Okay, Marcus, uh, I want to thank you very much for this very interesting uh, talk.
I'm still uh, thinking that uh, we all benefit from it because uh, you know it's now it's the mainstream. It's not the future. It's here. We all uh, actually inside of that. I think with different uh, uh, each one with his different uh, perspective uh, from design to uh, construction to asset management. And I think that uh, all the processes that you actually. Um, um, uh, talked about and uh, this uh, document that are now being prepared, I think will be, be a very uh, important part of this technology in, uh, I would say, civil engineering. And uh, we are all waiting, of course, to a quick uh, and uh, a quick uh, development in this uh, field because uh, I think that we mainly are now in the way of uh, transforming our way of work into these uh, platforms. And I think the work you're doing, uh, of course, uh, you and others, uh, I think is very important uh, to establish the, the rules and the basic for that. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we are all waiting maybe to a second part of that in the future, that we will see in the future what has changed. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to give this talk. Of course, it was only a maybe state of the art, more or less, an introduction. So, if you, of course, I would be happy to, to share uh, uh, more ideas, especially maybe to asset management and directions and challenges. I think it was a little bit too short this, this time, uh, but I'm, I would be happy, of course. Thank you very much. From my side also, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, it was an engaging talk. Uh, at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, Batik, uh, who actually provided us uh, with these uh, screens that we see behind it, also publishing the announcement, they're organizing the announcement. So thank you for them. This is, uh, you know, pro bono. And I would like also to say that uh, this talk is going to be available on YouTube in some time. I'm not quite sure, but it should be some time until it's going to be to be available there. And uh, to the final thing, I would like to say that our next live talk would be a little bit different. It's going to be given by Agnieszka Bigal van Vliet. She is working for TNO, and uh, the talk is going to be about reliability and about I am. I am safe project, which is a European project currently going on. With that and no further ado, I would like to thank the audience for being and keeping with us for all this time and uh, looking forward to, to see you in the next talk. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.